The subject of today's session is a return to Joseph. We've discussed in the past Joseph in Jacob's household with his brothers. Today we focus upon Joseph in Egypt. Joseph on a mission in Egypt for God. And as we shall see, in particular, in Genesis chapters 39, 40, and 41, Joseph faces unprecedented challenges, unique challenges, by virtue of where he is and who he is in that foreign land. And it is specifically by considering how Joseph faces these challenges and passes them that we can glean from these stories some profound lessons for ourselves. So we begin our story in Genesis chapter 39, where after having been told of Joseph's sale to Egypt at the end of chapter 37, we read about it once again. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, we can read his title either as captain of the guard or as chief of the slaughterers, where chief of the slaughterers can, of course, be understood as the chief cook, the chief of the kitchen staff. It could also mean chief as executioner. Whatever his role, he is described as an Egyptian who brought him out of the hand of the Ishmaelites that had brought him down there to Egypt. Now, of course, you note that besides the repetition of the end of chapter 37, there is a special repetitiveness in this verse. That is, if we read after all that Joseph was brought down to Egypt and that he was bought by an officer of Pharaoh's, do we really need to be told that the buyer was an Egyptian? After all, is it obvious? Of course, inevitably, the response must be, it is obvious. It's not coming to give us some information that otherwise we wouldn't know. But simultaneously, there is a special point of emphasis here. Let's consider the scene. Consider the circumstances of this, Joseph's first challenge. Remember, he's a 17-year-old boy. Not only removed forcibly from his family, from his home, from his land, not only is he alone in a foreign land, but which foreign land? It's Egypt. Egypt, the pinnacle of culture in the ancient world. A land whose people look down upon everyone else. Certainly the nomadic Hebrews with both pride and condescension. A land that, so far as its inhabitants were concerned, had everything. The pinnacle culture, a well-structured society, of course, a well-structured society in which the slaves were far and away the lowest class. But not only is Joseph coming into this society at the very bottom of society, he's coming in with a completely alien set of values, a belief in one God, completely at variance with the polytheism and idolatry of ancient Egypt, and moreover, with 
a belief in divinely ordained moral standards that the Egyptians could only regard as laughable. We, of course, as Bible believers, regard the connection between our faith in God and morality as obvious, as axiomatic. That connection didn't exist in the ancient pagan world at all, certainly not in ancient Egypt. So, of course, under the circumstances, our most natural expectation is this young, lowly slave, lonely and alone in a foreign land, would do his utmost to emulate the host country, do his utmost to assimilate into what was expected in good Egyptian society. And of course, that's not what happened. That that is not what happened becomes obvious already in the second verse. And God was with Joseph. Now, of course, we understand very well, God being with someone is not a reflection of divine caprice. It's a reflection of that someone being with God. So far as the Bible is concerned, of course, it is most important for us to know that God was with Joseph because of the impact that that made upon the people surrounding him. We understand very well that if God is with Joseph, Joseph is walking with God. Now, furthermore, the Bible goes on to emphasize that he was, in our translation here, a prosperous man. In the Hebrew, ish matzliach. Now, we should note here that matzliach, meaning prosperous or successful, does not appear for the first time here in the Bible. It appeared earlier on in the successful, prosperous journey of Abraham's servant in seeking a wife for Isaac in Genesis chapter 24. Simultaneously, we'll note that the Hebrew, matzliach, which generally speaking would be a verb to succeed, to prosper, is here employed as an adjective, ish matzliach, prosperous man. To the best of my knowledge, the only place in the entire Bible where that expression, ish matzliach, describing not merely the action, but the person, appears. Joseph was a prosperous man. This was the manner in which he impacted upon his surroundings. It was not merely the deed that was prosperous, that was successful. It was the person. Even though all this time, again, he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his prosperity is not a reflection of his being in the Egyptian's household, of his assimilating Egyptian ways, but rather on the contrary. Verse 3, and his master saw that God was with him and that God made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now you would think in Egyptian society where the whole notion of individuated divine providence for all intents and purposes didn't exist, that even if they did observe such successful consequences of Joseph's endeavors, the last place they would have attributed the source of that success would have been to some unseen God. But what we already sense at this point is that Joseph regards himself, as it were, as God's ambassador. Sufficiently so that when he succeeds, it's obvious to the Egyptians who wouldn't have even believed in 
the divine conferral of such success, that it was not merely that he was successful, but rather that God was with him, and God made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Whereupon we note the change in his master's attitude. Joseph starts out merely as a slave. In verse 4, Joseph found favor in his sight, and he ministered unto him. That is, he becomes not merely the generic slave, but the personal attendant. And furthermore, he appointed him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. We'll note here an additional nuance in the Hebrew. The vayaf kidehu, rendered here as, and he appointed him overseer, appears in this sense for the first place in Scripture. That is, that there is a well-defined appointment as overseer. We ex- encounter the expression in many later instances in scripture, but Joseph is the first. Joseph is the first because his divinely ordained success has impacted so obviously on everyone who sees him. And as a continuation of this rise in his success, it came to pass from the time that he appointed him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that God blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of God was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And of course, what that communicates to us, since we recognize the reciprocity, God is with whoever is with God, that despite Joseph's succeeding, he maintains his identity, he maintains his values, and thus he confronts and passes the first challenge, the challenge of coming as this lowly slave into the most advanced society in the ancient world. In verse 6, we read the pinnacle of Joseph's success, that his master left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and having him, he knew not aught save the bread that he did eat. Complete trust and confidence. And on a somewhat ominous note, considering what follows, Joseph was of beautiful form and fair to look upon. And this brings us in verse 7 to challenge number 2. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. Now, let's consider the circumstances. Besides the obvious, a 17-year-old boy being seduced in a manner that in the best of circumstances would have been an awfully alluring seduction. Furthermore, here, Joseph is all alone. No parents, no people coming from his value system are around to cast dispersions on a morally flawed choice that he might make. But much more than that, this is not a seduction by some common girl. This is a seduction by his mistress, the matron of the household in which he is slave. It should be obvious to us how much it would have been to Joseph's advantage to accept such an attractive offer. How well it could have assisted his integration into Egyptian society. And furthermore, 
there is not merely the carrot, but also the stick. Since this is, after all, his mistress, he knows very well that he is at her mercy. And if he crosses her the wrong way, the consequences can be devastating. This is Joseph's second challenge. And in verse 8, we see how he fared. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master, having me, knows not what is in the house and has put all that he had into my hand. In other words, he trusts me. There is no one greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. If I were to accept your offer, I would be betraying a trust. And not only would I be betraying the trust your husband gave to me, not only would I be sinning against him, but furthermore, how then can I do this great evil and sin against God? So here we have it, ironically. For the first place that we explicitly see Joseph invoking the name of God, we'll see many more. It is in a powerfully loaded passage where he accuses his mistress explicitly of evil and says, I'm not going because that would be a sin against God. That God, of course, all, in which the Egyptians don't even believe. Well, what takes place in the continuation of the passage is what undoubtedly Joseph realized could well happen. And that is, in as much as he refused the carrot, he got the stick. We read in the continuation of the passage how Joseph's master's wife frames him, accuses him of attempting to rape her. In verse 19, it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, After this manner did your servant to me, then his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So, of course, inevitably, we see Joseph sees all too clearly what the consequences were of his faithfulness to God and to the moral values that he had learned from his faith in God. They've landed him in prison. In prison, in which we'll note, he will be stuck until he's 30 years old. Remember, he came down to Egypt at age 17. Between the brief, sunny period that he was a lowly slave in his master's house and the subsequent imprisonment in which he languishes in prison 13 years of Joseph's life almost half of his life pass and yet Joseph doesn't forget about God in verse 21 but God was with Joseph and we already know that means if God is with Joseph, Joseph remains with God. And showed kindness unto him and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And just as his master before him, the keeper of the prison, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because God was with him. And that which he did, God made it to prosper. Again, we encounter 
that verb in the Hebrew, tzliach. And with respect to this prosperity, I think it's almost inevitable for us to consider the opening verses of the book of Psalms and their exquisite appropriateness with respect to the story of Joseph. Happy is the man that has not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah, the teaching of God, and in his Torah, in his teaching, he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Now, the continuation of the verse, where once again we find the same verb in a different conjugation, yatzliach, could be rendered, and in whatever he does, he shall prosper. Perhaps more precisely, we should render it, and whatever he does, he shall cause to prosper. He shall cause to prosper. Both because... He has made himself worthy of God's blessings. He shall cause to prosper because of the perseverance, because of the dedication to the goal that ultimately advances all worthy causes to a prosperous conclusion. And this we see as Joseph confronts challenge number three in jail. We already note that although all he's gotten for his efforts at remaining so faithful to God has been a precipitous worsening of his situation, God continues to be with him because he continues to be with God. And we see this dramatically expressed in what takes place in Genesis chapter 40. When we read of the imprisonment of the Pharaoh's butler and baker and their dreams. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 5, they dreamed the dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were bound in the prison. Now remember, this is still happening in Egypt, in a land and a culture that is in so many ways antithetical to everything that Joseph represents. In verse 6, And Joseph came to them in the morning and saw them, and behold, they were wroth, they were troubled. And he asked Pharaoh's officers, why do you look so sad today? And they said, well, we have dreamed a dream and there is no one that can interpret it. Now first, consider very simply the humanity. Joseph is concerned. He sees people who are troubled. He asks them what troubles them. Second of all, Given the opportunity, whose name does Joseph invoke after everything that he's been through in prison? Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it me, I pray you. And what follows, of course, is the butler's dream and Joseph's interpretation that the butler sees a vine with three tendrils, the three tendrils are three days, and the message of the dream is, in verse 13, within yet three days shall Pharaoh lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall give Pharaoh's cup in his hand, like the former manner when you were his butler. And then, Joseph appends to the interpretation of the dream. Two additional verses. 
two additional verses of extraordinary poignance. What will emerge in the chronology of Joseph's sojourn in Egypt is he adds these two verses after more than a decade of slavery and imprisonment. Verses 14 and 15. But have me in your remembrance when it will be well with you and show kindness, I pray you, unto me and make mention of me to Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. A heart-rending plea. And we can well imagine at this point, Joseph is desperate. Again, over a decade has passed. He's gotten nowhere. His fidelity to God has landed him in the lowest of the low. But simultaneously, consider how inspiring these words. Because while Joseph may be desperate, he isn't sparing. He hasn't given up. He's still hoping, even anticipating. Something is going to come of all this. And maybe Pharaoh's butler will be the means for that to take place. He's still, after everything that he has experienced, after the entire ordeal that he has witnessed, hoping for the future. And that inevitably brings us to Genesis chapter 41. Beginning in verse 1, and it came to pass at the end of two full years, two full years later, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And of course, you all know the story of Pharaoh's dream. And finally, after two full years have passed, the butler so to speak, wakes up. Because in verse 8 we read, and it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I make mention of my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in the ward of the chief of the slaughterers. Me, and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the chief of the slaughterers. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Of course, inevitably, this is exactly what Pharaoh was waiting for. So we very readily understand the beginning of the following verse, verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. After all, Pharaoh's desperate. He's anxious for an interpretation for his dream. And we can well imagine someone in Pharaoh's position is not used to having to wait patiently for anything. And what's so extraordinary in verse 14 is the second half of the verse. Remember, they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And then what happens? And he shaved himself and changed his garments. And then, only then, came in unto Pharaoh. Now, obviously, this is a very time-consuming process. Not at all consistent with having brought, been brought hastily out of the dungeon. Indeed, in describing him as coming in unto Pharaoh, there is no implication of haste at all. And perhaps an important key in understanding this strange switch in mid-verse is by considering the implications of 
changing his garments. Now, of course, I realize changing garments is something that we do all the time. And yet, when we consider what it was like in the ancient world, we realize, first of all, they didn't have so many garments. They didn't have vast wardrobes. Second of all, what were they going to change? They also didn't have an abundant supply of water for laundering garments. So the truth is that they undoubtedly wore whatever it is that they wore for quite a long time. That would be true even in the higher echelons of society, all the more so a lowly slave. Who altogether would have cared for him to have had an opportunity to change his clothes ever? And yet he does. He changes his garments. And one cannot help but note here that this expression, changing his garments, changing garments, in the Hebrew, Vaychalef Simlotav, appears in a similar form altogether only two other times in the Bible. Now, I'm not implying that only two other times in the Bible did people ever change their clothing. That is, of course, we do recognize that there are circumstances as part of the process of ritual purification in which the Torah prescribes washing, laundering the garments. But in this expression, as opposed to laundering or washing, changing one's garments, this expression appears exactly three times, of which Joseph's changing his clothing is in the chronology of the Bible. Time number two. Let's consider one and three. In Genesis chapter 35, we read upon the return to the land of Israel of Jacob and his household. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Why? Verse 3, and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make their altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress. What role then does changing the garments play? Well, it's fairly obvious. That is, first of all, it is juxtaposed with purifying yourselves. So you purify yourselves and change your garments. Second of all, we sense very clearly that this changing of the garments is intended to amount to a new beginning. After all, they were outside of the land. They had acquired, because of the plundering of Shechem or other circumstances, a horde that included strange gods and other undesirables. And they needed a change. The change of garments is an outward reflection of a change in state of mind. Again, we're going up to Bethel to make their altar unto God. So this change of gar garments we understand very well in that context. Again, on the one hand, purification, but additionally, perhaps more importantly, the new beginning. That's the first place where the expression appears. The only other instance in which the expression changing of garments appears is in the second book of Samuel in chapter 12. This is a very poignant, moving passage to recall its context. I begin reading 
from chapter 12, verse 16. After the relations of King David and Bathsheba, she bears a child. And God smites the child as the prophet Nathan tells David he would his punishment for what David had done. Child is smitten, critically ill. In verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and came and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and stood beside him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he hearkened not unto our voice. How then shall we tell him that the child is dead, so that he do himself some harm? They're afraid he's going to commit suicide. But when David saw that his servants whispered together, David perceived that the child was dead. And David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He's dead. And here we get to the climax, if you will, and the changing of garments in verse 20. Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, and changed his garments. And he came into the house of God and prostrated himself. Then he came to his own house, and he asked, and they set bread before him, and he did eat. Now, of course, at this point, his servants don't know what to make of what they're seeing. Then said his servants to him, What thing is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while it was alive, but when the child is dead, now you rise and eat bread? And King David responds, recalling he isn't just a king. He is their leader and their teacher. While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. But he will not return to me. Given what King David says to the servants, we discern in his changing his garments in verse 20 a very different theme than in Jacob's words to the people of his household. For King David, it's not a new beginning. It's also not in any way essentially an act of purification. It is rather a profound statement. A statement that communicates to his servants an important message. A message about our belief in God, a message about our belief in God's justice, a message about our faith in God as righteous judge. And so David changes his garments. We'll note that the theme of the clothing as means to making a statement 
as King David does by changing his garments. We discern elsewhere as well. I'll share with you that in our tradition, that is a message to be gleaned from Daniel chapter 3. Now, in Daniel chapter 3, you'll recall that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that is, by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Aved Nego, are accused, indicted, of not having bowed down to and prostrated themselves before the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, great king of Babylon, had set up so that all of his servants would be subjects to the same deity. And so, we read in Daniel chapter 3, from verse 13 and on, then Nebuchadnezzar, upon hearing that these seemingly faithful servants had refused to bow down before his golden image, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then were these men brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you serve not my gods, nor prostrate yourselves to the golden image that I have set up? And he taunts them. If I throw you into the burning, fiery furnace as I have threatened, who's going to save you? And they respond in verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Behold, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. He will deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and out of your hand, O king. But the truth is we have no guarantee at all that God will save us. We know he can, but of course we don't know if he will. If not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor prostrate ourselves to the golden image that you have set up. Even if it costs us our lives, we're not compromising on our values. Then was the Nebuchadnezzar filled with fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He thought they were his faithful servants, but they refused to bow down before his idol. He spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was one to be heated. And he commanded certain mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And then we read in verse 21. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, and their robes, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And of course, inevitably, the question that most transparently pertains to this verse is, why all the details of the attire? Why all the wardrobe? But then the deeper question is, why did these men array themselves in all of their fineries when they're not going out for a stroll? They're going to be hurled into a burning, fiery furnace. And that's precisely the answer. When you're about to be hurled into a burning, fiery furnace, you don't say, Oh, well, what difference does it make? I may as well just wear rags. You're being thrown into that burning, fiery furnace because of your faithfulness, your fidelity to God. You're making a statement. You make that statement in your best suit. You array yourselves to the utmost in order to communicate that message. So when they were bound up, to be thrown into the furnace. They were bound up in their cloaks, their tunics, their robes, all their other garments. They came to what was to have been their execution in their finest attire, their best suits.
because it's a message that needs to be communicated. And the truth is that when you want to communicate a message, you should get dressed up for the role. And so, just as King David changed his garments in order to make a statement, in order to teach a message to his servants, so too, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah don't change their clothing in order to likewise communicate a message, teach Nebuchadnezzar and his pagan hordes. Now, returning on that note to the story of Joseph. And again, that Pharaoh had sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the, dun of the dungeon. And instead of Joseph exceeding and hastily going to Pharaoh, he shaved himself and changed his garments. So we have two templates for understanding why. The template of Jacob's household and the template of King David. Which is it? Perhaps a combination of both. That is, on the one hand, it may very well be an act of purification from his life in bondage and a preparation for the new beginning now that he's coming to stand before Pharaoh. Could be. And yet. Could very well also not be. Joseph has no indication that after the day's proceedings, he isn't going to be thrown back into the dungeon for incarceration without any hope of parole. He really doesn't have any obvious reason for confidence that anything has changed. But one thing is clear. He's about to speak to Pharaoh. He has an unparalleled opportunity to make a statement. And to the extent that in each of the three previous levels of challenge that Joseph faced, that is, challenge number one, simply being a lowly, lonely slave in an Egyptian household. Level number two, when he is seduced by his master's wife. Level number three, after paying the price for having refused that seduction and ended up in jail, continuing to go with God in jail and invoking God's name to his fellow prisoners. Now, after having passed those three challenges so well, he is about to face the greatest challenge of all. The challenge that comes when he stands before Pharaoh. And he's going to face that challenge and make his statement in his best possible attire. We continue in Genesis chapter 41, verse 15. After, finally, Joseph has arrived in the throne room. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it, and I have heard say of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And as a result, I've been waiting patiently for you to finally finish changing your clothes and shaving. Remember, Pharaoh had summed in Joseph hastily, and he didn't respond hastily. We already noted Pharaoh was undoubtedly not one to have been accustomed to waiting patiently for that which he desired, indeed demanded, to be delivered. There is, of course, an additional dimension that should be borne in mind here, and that is Pharaoh's status versus that of Joseph. Pharaoh, the mightiest man in Egypt, which is the mightiest country on earth, by simple implication of the above, Pharaoh is the mightiest man on earth. The strongest leader. One, moreover, who can issue orders of execution and reprieve 
with the flick of his hand. Life and death he exercises with merely a glance. And Joseph, lowly, lonely slave in a foreign land, stands before the mightiest man in the world at the time. Well, what do you think Joseph is going to have to say? Pharaoh just says, I've heard say of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. First thing Joseph has to say to Pharaoh is, you're wrong. Incorrect. Incorrect. Do you realize what he's done? The first thing he has to say to the most powerful man on earth is, I need to correct you. Excuse me? Remember, Pharaoh isn't just the most powerful man on earth. Pharaoh is also considered a god. You're correcting a god? The audacity. The first time that you speak with him, the first sentence you have to say is, not so, you got it wrong. Do you realize how insane this is? It's not merely ridiculous, it's crazy. It's practically an act of suicide. We could well have anticipated that the very next line, Pharaoh would say, off with his head. And as if to make matters worse, Joseph doesn't just say Pharaoh is wrong. He doesn't merely state, it is not in me. He states, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now consider the implications of the statement. Number one, of course, he has, in a way, yanked the rug out from under himself because Pharaoh had summoned him only because he heard that Joseph will be able to interpret his dream. And here, Joseph is saying, no, I don't do any interpretations. So what are you here for? And second of all, even worse. Remember, Pharaoh was considered a god. Joseph says, the real god, not you, the real God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So, why is he doing this? Is Joseph attempting to get himself killed? And of course, the obvious answer is no, but he's also not in that throne room merely to pander to Pharaoh in the hope of getting a reprieve. This is Joseph's fourth challenge, and he confronts it masterfully. Joseph's response to that challenge is, I need to tell you something about God. I have an opportunity to make a statement. What will come of it afterward? I have no idea. I may not even be alive to see it. But if I'm in Egypt with a mission, a mission for God, that mission that impelled me to stand with God in the face of all the challenges of being a lowly, lonely slave, that mission that impelled me to turn my back on the seduction of my mistress and say, if I listen to you, I'm sinning against God, that mission that impels him even after, as a result of speaking about God, he ends up in jail to continue to speak about God, to continue to go with God wherever he goes. That mission impels Joseph here, undoubtedly, to say to himself, wow, this is the greatest opportunity ever. To achieve what? Not liberty. Not freedom for me, but rather to advance my mission. Now I'm not merely teaching my fellow prisoners about God, I'm teaching Pharaoh. And we see this in what follows, because after Pharaoh conveys to Joseph his dream, Verse 25, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. What God is about to do, he has declared unto Pharaoh. 
And then he goes on to speak of the seven good, kind, and the seven good ears versus the seven lean, kind, and the empty ears as years of plenty versus years of famine. Verse 28. That is the thing which I spoke unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he has shown unto Pharaoh. And further elaboration with respect to the years of plenty and the years of famine that follow. And culminating in verse 32, for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing stands ready from God. And God will shortly bring it to pass. It's all about God. Only after having spoken such great length about God does Joseph then move into the additional mode of telling Pharaoh what he needs to do, which in itself is the pinnacle of audacity. That is, there isn't any obvious reason that we would say the contents of the dream imply that Joseph should continue now in verse 33 with telling Pharaoh what he should be doing. But he does. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man understanding and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint overseers over the land and take up a fifth part of the land of Egypt or prepare the land of Egypt in the seven years of plenty and let them gather all the food of these good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it, and so on. Joseph is teacher. He has a message. And he's not going to refrain from conveying it as fully as necessary, as fully as possible. And maybe, yes, maybe it will lead to some new appointment for Joseph, what of course comes to pass. But it's only after Joseph emphasizes, don't think it's at all about me. It's all exclusively about God. And extraordinarily, Pharaoh gets this message. In verse 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has shown you all this, there is none so understanding and wise as you. And he points him over his household. And of course, inevitably, there's a critically important message for us, for each of us here. And that is never, ever compromise on your truth. That is, Joseph speaks his mind. He tells Pharaoh all about God when there isn't the slightest indication that Pharaoh had the slightest interest in hearing about it. But of course, Joseph is faithful to his truth, ultimately. Everyone gets the message. Everyone around him realizes this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And of course we realize that this establishes Joseph after those four great challenges as the one who has passed them all. And by consequence, as one who truly rules over himself, the one who is ready to rule over the land of Egypt. But there's one additional nuance that we should stress here. And I think this is particularly insightful when we consider what happens in Joseph's family life. And that is, in verse 45, we read that Pharaoh gives Joseph a wife, Osnath, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of On. And in verse 50 we read, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the year of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore unto him. A very 
cumbersome and repetitive verse. And what makes it all the more repetitive is it's practically repeated verbatim in Genesis chapter 46, verse 20. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Masha and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore unto him. What do we have to be told twice? Unto Joseph were born, whom Asenath bore unto him. Almost the same double expression that we found in Genesis chapter 41, verse 50 as well. Why all the repetitiveness? Uh, but when we consider who this Joseph is, again, the one who doesn't compromise, the one who doesn't hold back on his truth, we realize he also has a fifth challenge, if you will. After his appointment, he marries the daughter of one of the great priests of Egypt, undoubtedly a priestly noble family. She is born into the privileged class and a privileged existence. He, remember, until not long before the wedding, was a lowly slave in prison. So you might well anticipate that while on some, if you will, biological plane, Asenath bears Joseph, his sons, the sons whom she bears are not really going to be his. They will be models of Egyptian nobility. We'll do our utmost to forget about Joseph's background. And of course, together with that, to forget about Joseph's values, ideals, his faith and faithfulness to God. But then the Bible tells us these children were born to Joseph. Not merely that Asenath bore them to Joseph, but they were indeed born to Joseph. That when you are truly faithful to your ideals, to your values, to God, everyone around you will notice. Instead of Joseph assimilating into the privileged class from which Asenath hailed, Asenath assimilates herself into the spiritual mission of Joseph. And their children are children faithful to the God of Israel and the mission of Israel. So much so that in Genesis chapter 48, when Jacob has already come down to Egypt himself and is in fact on his deathbed. Jacob says to Joseph, and now your two sons who were born unto you in the land of Egypt before I came unto you into Egypt are mine. Mine in what sense? Ephraim and Manasseh, even as Reuben and Simeon will be mine, meaning they are reckoned as tribes not as children of tribes, as tribes. But Joseph's two sons become tribes, which in a way confers upon Joseph himself a sort of semi-patriarchal status because he gives birth to tribes. But note that these sons born in exile are worthy of being tribes. And indeed, Later on in the passage, when in a kind of stylized exchange, Jacob, here described as Israel, the breadth and depth of vision of Israel, sees Joseph's two sons. He asks Joseph, who are these? And when Joseph responds, they are my sons. Jacob says, bring them, I pray you, unto me, and I will bless them. And we read in chapter 48, verse 20, and he blessed them that day, saying, by you shall Israel bless, saying, God make you 
as Ephraim and as Menashe. Of course, as you know, these words of our father Jacob are fulfilled at least every week, every evening of Shabbat, when all Israel continues to bless the children. May God make you as Ephraim and Menashe. Why specifically Ephraim and Menashe? Aren't there other role models? There are undoubtedly other role models. But Ephraim and Menashe grew up as the first members of the nation of Israel born into exile. And they remain faithful. And they project that message of faithfulness. That undoubtedly they absorb, they imbibe from their father Joseph. Through indeed all of these challenges and through his passing them, Joseph becomes who he becomes. And it is in that vein that, in conclusion, I'd like to consider one final passage in Genesis chapter 41. And that is the names that Joseph gives to these two children. In verse 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Menashe. For God, we could translate this as, has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Ouch. He certainly had a miserable time there, didn't he? And for all he knows, he may have assumed that Jacob has long since died of heartache over him and his brothers, his brothers who tried to kill him, have hijacked the mission of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We much more readily understand the blessing of the second son, nonetheless. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Once again, speaking as he relentlessly does about God, God giving him prosperity, God making him fruitful. But let's return to that blessing of Menashe. As I've noted here, there is an alternative way of translating these words. The Hebrew, Nashani, appears in this form only once in the Bible. The truth is, though, that even if it wouldn't appear only once, there is a built-in ambiguity in the conjugation, because the same three root letters that underlie Nashani have two different, apparently unrelated meanings. One, as implicit in the primary translation that we use here, is forget. That is, that God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. But there's another meaning of the same root, and that is to be a creditor. We can render this verse, he has made into creditors for me all my trouble and all my father's house. We'll just note briefly that the examples that follow all pertain to the use of this root as meaning to be a creditor. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 24, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 and 11, and many other passages in the Bible. What does it mean to say God has made into creditors for me all my trouble and all my father's house. Because, you know, all this time, for all of the intervening 13 years that Joseph was languishing as slave and prisoner in Egypt, I thought all my trouble 
and all my father's house, where they're just there to make me miserable. But now that I'm able to see where they brought me, they brought me to everything that I have achieved. I regard all that trouble as creditor in that I owe it a profound debt of gratitude. The gratitude for having been able to achieve what ultimately I was able to achieve. To be able to view the hardships of life, the challenges of life, the misery of life, as the basis of everything that one is ultimately able to achieve in life. In the last chapter of the prophet Micha, in chapter 7, verse 8, we read, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I am fallen, I am arisen. When I sit in darkness, God is a light unto me. In our tradition, comment. If I had not fallen, I would not have arisen. If I would not have sat in darkness, God would not have been my light. Joseph teaches us that. With all the falls and all the darkness, he does rise. And he rises in the light of God. In perhaps a similar vein, we read in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked stumble in evil. The righteous man falls seven times, not... And despite that, he rises up again. But rather, he has the foresight, the insight, and maybe most of all, the perseverance to transform each of those falls into a rise, into a new beginning. That, more than anything else, is the summons of true transcendence. That is the lesson of Joseph to us as well. So when we consider what we learn in these chapters, Genesis chapters 39, 40, and 41, from Joseph for our own lives, well, first of all, of course, that message, always be true to who you are. Be true to God. Be true to your mission. Be true to your identity. Be true to your truth. Joseph never held back. God was upon his lips and in his heart all the time. He never compromised on what he held most dear. That was his mission, to spread that truth, to spread that message. And while faced with such overwhelming adversity, he prevails in becoming, through it all, precisely who it is whom God had charged him to become. In the prophecy of Avadya, in verse 18, we read the words of the prophet, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. That 
ultimate, eventual transcendence can only be attained when in addition to the house of Jacob, you also have the house of Joseph. Jacob provides the fire. It is of that fire, undoubtedly, that the flame of Joseph is lit. But if you only have the fire without the flame, it doesn't get anywhere. Joseph is on the move. Joseph is the flame. The flame that extends that fire outward, that consumes the enemies of God, and that illuminates a world that might otherwise be languishing in darkness. Can't help but add here, the world in which we live today, in so many ways, perhaps too many ways, it's very reminiscent of ancient Egypt, especially in Europe today, but not only in Europe today. Truly, sincerely speaking in the name of God is viewed as a ridiculous anachronism, an outdated, antiquated fantasy. And undoubtedly, there are people who are just too embarrassed to admit they remain faithful. To God, to the God of the Bible, to the God who teaches us the way of truth, the way of morality. Never be ashamed of being faithful to the truth that you know. Learn from Joseph, who even in that last, most terrifying challenge, standing before Pharaoh, doesn't hold back doesn't retreat, remains true to himself, remain true and speak God's message to a world that needs to hear that message, even if it doesn't think it's ready to hear it. And simultaneously, the message for us within in recognizing with all the challenges that we face, with all of the hardships that confront us, with all the fallings, with all the darkness, with everything that we endure round about. When I fall, I am arisen. When I sit in darkness, God is my light. And if I sincerely integrate those words, that conviction, I may yet, like Joseph, look back upon all the hardship, all the trouble, and say, I am indebted to all the trouble, all the hardship, everything, everything even to the utmost detail of misery, because only thus did I grow into self and appreciate that unique message, that unique mission that God charged me to deliver to the world, to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. So, we learn about Joseph's mission in Egypt for God. And it teaches us about our missions in, perhaps, our own respective miniature missions for God in our little Egypts wherever they may be found. When we remain true to God, when we remain true to ourselves, we know we shall prevail. We shall overcome. God. God bless you.